So let's continue uh, looking at the characteristics of God, the Holy Spirit. We've come now to, to John the Baptist and Jesus. The Holy Spirit is God who works to magnify God's word and empowers his people to do his work on earth. Number two, the Trinity is a unit. The Father plans, the Son accomplishes, and the Spirit empowers and applies the finishing touches. Let's go to this first one. The Holy Spirit is God who works to magnify God's word and empowers his people to do his work on earth. So take your Bibles and go to Luke chapter 1. Now we need to understand, even as we come into the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we need to realize that this is still part, in the sense of the Old Testament, and uh, still God's working in that particular time. So after God brought, you remember Israel was, had, had been taken into captivity, and eventually God brought, them, God brought them back into the land, and then for 400 years, we had these 400 we had these 400 silent years where God didn't, God didn't speak for those 400 years. Not by prophet, not by vision, not by angel. And so as, we, as he was going along, as that 400 years was coming to end, uh, God broke that silence when he, when he addressed the, a man, a priest by the name of Zechariah, while he was working in the temple. And so let's pick up this story as God reveals and speaks to the man Zechariah um, at this point in time. Luke chapter 1, verses 13 to 17. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Okay, so what is the, what is the Holy Spirit going to be in the life of John? He's going to be filled from birth. Absolutely. Okay, what else does it describe? How else does, how else does it describe the work of God the Holy Spirit in the life of John? Yes, turning the hearts of the people back to, towards, uh, to, towards God and, and preparing them for God's uh, coming. So John would be filled, he would be saturated, he would be permeated with God the Holy Spirit from birth. So as a result, he would be furnished, given what was necessary so that he would fulfill what God was asking him to do. And so just defining those terms. So in turning people back to the Lord, John would have a message, a very simple message, where he would be uh, proclaiming a message of repentance, acknowledging that God is holy, we must be holy, admitting that we're uh, calling people to admit that their sin was against God and we're helplessly lost, and, and calling people to reject their own way and look only to God. And so there was a message of repentance. So now as we look at this message that God the Holy Spirit led John to do, what the Holy Spirit is doing, he's leading John to magnify God's word. How so? How is that message of repentance magnifying God's word? Yeah, absolutely. And so this message of repentance was the same message that God gave to Adam way back in, the, way back in his sin, wasn't it? And it's the same message that goes all the way through. And so there's a consistency there leading them, leading him to declare, to declare the truth. Um, as well, um, he led John to fulfill Old Testament prophecy, didn't he? So notice, that, notice the wording there. You're going to turn your fathers back to their children to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so what is the Holy Spirit in filling John to do, leading John to do? is to fulfill a prophecy that God had declared through the prophet Malachi of the coming messenger just before his, his coming. And so, again, the Holy Spirit is lining up, is connected with the truth of God's Word. See, now the Holy Spirit also let John to uphold God's character, didn't he? And we've got to see this connection. And we're going to look at this in a moment, that the Trinity is a unit, but here already in the life of John, the Holy Spirit, of how he's leading John, is to uphold God's character. Now notice, he's upholding God's holiness. And he's leading John to declare that. Not separating, not diminishing, but upholding. And so there's that unity and that bringing together, and we've got to see this for what it is. 
He, and the Holy Spirit also empowered John to live a radical life of obedience and then to declare God's word with authority and with power as, it, as did the prophet Elijah. And so again, we've got to see this interplay of the, of the work of the Holy Spirit, not separate, but connected to. And, and again, if we don't see that, we're going to get ourselves into trouble. So wherever God the Holy Spirit has worked, he always magnifies God's word and he always empowers what God is doing on this earth. And he always fits in with God's agenda. So then about the age 29, John began his public ministry. And we know it that John began to preach, didn't he? And because he was filled by the power of the Holy Spirit, God used him powerfully, used him powerfully in the lives of many, many people. Now, as we go to John chapter 3, you go to John chapter 3 there, here's another evidence of the filling of the Holy Spirit in John's life. And so at this point in this juncture, if you remember correctly, um, John's disciples are, are pushing John to assert himself, to kind of push himself forward, to, to uh, assume his position as leader in the movement of God. And so now notice John's response in the power and the, through the filling of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 3, verses 26 to 30. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and they are, all, they are all going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Okay, so what evidence, what evidence do we have of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit in John's life in this passage here? What evidence do we have? Yeah, his humility. To what level? Like, how, what, what, what are the, what, what are the revelations, like, how do we see his humility here? Yes. Christ must increase. I must decrease. John also recognizes everything that I have, I've received from my Father. I'm not standing on anything of my own merit, right? We also see his, his humility and deferring everything to, 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 to the deliverer, to Christ, isn't he? Okay? What other characteristics do you see of, of the filling of the Holy Spirit in John's life here? Yes, he accepted the fact that his job was done. It wasn't about his name being famous. Do you see the joy? Do you see the joy that comes through here? What was his joy? What was the joy that the Holy Spirit led him in? Yes, the liver has come. And everything was about magnitude. His joy was bound up not in what it would do to him and his fame and his greatness. It was about God being famous and, le and leading forward and all of that. So think about that. If a person claims to be led by the Spirit of God, then these same evidences will be a part of their life. Because God the Holy Spirit always magnifies God word, God's word and always empowers people to do to, to, to God's work here on earth. You can't have one without the other. And so we've got to see this for what it is. Now six months after the, the angel Gabriel visited Zechariah, he also came to a young virgin by the name of Mary. And we know the story. Let's go back to Luke chapter 1, verses 34 to 35. And let's see what the work of the Holy Spirit was at this point. So and Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Okay, so how is this miracle going to take place? How, yeah, through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to conceive life in Mary, isn't he? And, and so we understand. So Mary was engaged to Joseph, but they had no sexual relationship because they weren't married. And so because the Holy Spirit conceived life in Mary, God is the father of Jesus, not Joseph. And so it's important to understand that Jesus didn't descend from a human father. If he descended from a human father, he would inherit sin, and he would not be able to be our, to be our deliverer. And so it's, it's imperative that we understand that he was conceived holy and is a spotless uh, lamb of God, able to set us free. 
So here's another instance of the Holy Spirit doing what? Here in the life of Mary, magnifying God's work and empowering God's, uh, empowering, excuse me, magnifying God's word and empowering God's work. How so? How do we see God the Holy Spirit magnifying God's word, magnifying God's word and empowering God's work? Yes, fulfilling prophecy because God declared back in Genesis 3.15, what's going to happen? The deliverer is going to be born of a, of a woman. So what is the Holy Spirit doing here? He's fulfilling what God declared. Do you see the connection? The Holy Spirit is never diverts, never moves away from the truth of God's word. He can't. He's also, he's also empowering God's work, isn't he? He's empowering and enabling this promise of God to, to, come, to come to fulfillment, the deliverer to come into, 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 into being. This is huge. This is our consistent God, and we've got to see this. So notice how God the Holy Spirit will be intertwined with Jesus, ministry while on earth. And so the first example of this is in, in Luke chapter 3. Before Jesus begins his ministry, John the, God the Holy Spirit led John the, the Baptist to make this declaration about Christ in John chapter 3, verse 16. John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Okay, so Jesus is, so John the Baptist is declaring, what, what is Christ going to do? See, see how, intertwined, how intertwined the work of God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. So God the Son is going to immerse people into what? Going to baptize them into? God the Holy Spirit. And so they see the interplay, the interconnection between the two of them. And so those who would accept him, God, Jesus, would baptize, immerse them, so the Holy Spirit would indwell them permanently. But those who rejected him, Jesus is going to baptize them in? In fire, which is the lake of fire, because they rejected them. So again, how is the Holy Spirit magnifying God's word and empowering God's work in this, at this point here. Yes, absolutely. But what is the Holy, how is the Holy, what is the Holy Spirit's work now here in this ba being baptized, believers being baptized into the Holy Spirit? How is that magnifying God's word? Fulfilling, Fulfilling prophecy, absolutely. But also declaring and leading, leading us into what God has declared from the beginning, that level of intimacy of relationship, enabling that relationship that he's declared. And so he's fulfilling. He is empowering God's work to transform us and to lead us into that relationship. So again, we've got to see this interplay and this connection of how the Holy Spirit upholds God's word doesn't operate on, an, on his own whim, doesn't operate on his own plan, his own purposes. He's connected to the work of God and what God has declared. And we've got to see that, that connection through. So later, when Jesus was baptized, it goes even a little bit deeper. So John, uh, Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and, and 22. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. Okay, so how involved, how involved was the Holy Spirit in Jesus' ministry? So not only would Jesus baptize those who accepted him, not only would he baptize them into the Holy Spirit, but how, how intimate was the Holy Spirit in Jesus' actual ministry? Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. So God the Father declares, this is my special, this is my uh, beloved son. But now what's the Holy Spirit doing? The Holy Spirit does what? He descended on him physically and indwells and, emp and empowers. Now again, this fulfills another prophecy. This fulfills another declaration that God had declared. If you go back, if you remember, back in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, the deliverer will be indwelled by, this, by the Holy Spirit. And so here is another declaration. Here the Holy Spirit is not doing his own thing. He's actually fulfilling and, and, and bringing together what God has declared. And we see this interplay of how it works and what God is doing in the life of, in the life of Christ. See, the Holy Spirit glorified God by fulfilling what was promised and staying consistent with, with, with God's word. So let's apply this. 
So the Holy Spirit is God. He works to magnify God's word, and he empowers his people to do his work on earth. So we became a child of God at the moment of our rescue, didn't we? The moment that we responded in repentance and faith. And so as we continue in these lessons, God's word is going to reveal how he's going to baptize, how he's going to immerse us into the Holy Spirit. So we need to anticipate it. So think about that. As God declared over here that a deliverer was going to come, and the deliverer did come, God also makes the declaration in Luke 3.16 that he will baptize us. He's going to immerse us in the Holy Spirit. And so the same one that made that declaration and fulfilled it is the same one who made the declaration he's going to indwell us by his Spirit. And so we need to rest on that. We need to anticipate that. And we'll see that as we go forward. So from the life of Jesus and John, excuse me, John and Jesus, we're also going to begin to see evidences of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And these as well, we need to begin to anticipate it. Because where God the Holy Spirit is at work, there is a transformation. We saw that earlier in the life of Saul, didn't we? We saw there was a change that took place. And so where God the Holy Spirit is, it's a supernatural event. And so we need to anticipate that it's unexplainable in all natural um, um, means. And so we're going to see, um, as a result of the Holy Spirit, there's going to be a radical life of obedience. We need to expect that. That's where he's leading us. Uh, he's going to be leading to humility, recognizing all that we have is from God. Uh, it's going to be humility in, in deferring all glory to God the Deliverer, deferring everything. It's not about us. It's about Him. It's about His name. And so where the Holy Spirit is moving, it's all about magnifying the work in the person of Christ. And that's an evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, another evidence of the, of the Holy Spirit in our life is there will always be a declaration of who God is as a deliverer king, de and revealing and declaring it boldly. Another evidence of the Holy Spirit. Another evidence will be joy in God's plan as the deliverer comes to fulfillment. It will be radical commitment to fulfill God's plan, and it's going to be dependency upon God the Holy Spirit in all of ministry. So the question is, as believers in Jesus Christ, are we seeing those characteristics being developed in our own lives? Are we seeing God leading us deeper and more and more into humility? Because the level of our connection to God the Holy Spirit will be the level of that continual growing in humility, moving forward and recognizing that all that we have is because of Christ. Are we as believers realizing and understanding that more and more of a radical obedience and commitment to fulfill what he's called us to? Another evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need to anticipate it. A passion, a passion that just, as we see God's work unfolding, a joy just overwhelming as we see God's work going forward. Are we seeing that same thing taking place in our lives? Again, evidences of the Holy Spirit. We need to be expecting that as we go forward. <clears throat> so let me try to illustrate the work of God, the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's a real simple illustration, but think about our cars. A car can't just run on its own. What does a car need? It needs fuel, doesn't it? A car is just a piece of, is just a, a, a bolts and, and all kinds of mechanical devices, but there's no fuel to make it run. It's, 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 it's useless. In the sense, the car is like the work of God. The God, the Holy Spirit, is the fuel that empowers, that powers God's work. As we did nothing to save ourselves, we can do nothing in going forward to accomplish the work of God in ourselves. We need the God, the Holy Spirit, to empower us to do what he asks us to do. Now, as we, as we think about this here for a second, we just need to unpack another application point. As we understand that the Holy Spirit magnifies God's Word, we need to stop and think about something here that's very, very profound that we need to understand. Everything that the Holy Spirit does will line up with God's Word. It will never, ever contradict it. And so we've got to put this exclamation part mark right here and understand the very character of God, the Holy Spirit. He magnifies God's word. He never diverts from it. He never contradicts it. He never moves beyond it. So as a result, we can use a very simple test to begin evaluating if something is of God, the Holy Spirit or not. Number one, does it magnify God's word? 
Is God's word lifted high by whatever it is? If God's word is not lifted high, then it's not God the Holy Spirit that's empowering it. Period. Because God, the Holy Spirit, always magnifies truth. Number two, here's another question we can ask. Does it empower for God's work and his agenda, or does it empower for a work of man? So whatever it is that you're asking for, does it empower God's agenda? Does it empower what God has declared, what he is about in his word? Is it empowering that, or is it lifting up a man? Is it moving forward a plan of a man? If it's lifting up a man, then guess what? It's not God the Holy Spirit. And we've got to see this. So think about this as believers in Jesus Christ. He doesn't leave us as orphans. He doesn't leave us as isolated. He has given us his word, his unchanging word, that we can evaluate everything to know what is true or false. And so that's why his word is so dear, is so important. And that's why God the Holy Spirit wants us to see. And that's where he's going to continue to lead us, is to God's word. He's going to take us to truth, to truth, to truth. So we know truth, we're transformed by truth. And if we know the truth, it's going to set us free. God is gracious, isn't he? As we see that. Two, we must also, excuse me, And going forward, we must also only define the work of God, the Holy Spirit, from God's Word. See, sadly, so often, we, as we start talking about God, the Holy Spirit, we start moving away from truth, and we start listening to experience. This experience, that experience, this Word, that Word, this vision, that vision. And we've got to be so careful because, again, we see this, that the Holy Spirit magnifies God's Word. God's Word is our final authority, and as a result, we need to test everything against God's Word, as the Holy Spirit will never contradict it. See, God's Word is absolute. See, remember, there's only two voices in this world. There's God's voice, and there's Satan's. And so as we go forward, we need to make sure that we're listening to God's voice, and this is the primary way to understand it and to hear from him. So as a result, God's word is our only way to know if something is from God or not. And so in this light, in this light, again, we're going to, like I come back to, we're going to start developing this chart so we know what is actually the Holy Spirit based on the truth of God's word. So here's another, here's another test we can know of, of whether it's the Holy Spirit or not. If what we're looking at, is there, is there a sense of humility in it? If there's not a sense of humility, and if it doesn't pass the test of humility, then is it the God, the Holy Spirit? No, it's not. And so again, God in his grace has given us so many tools to understand. And so this is why it's important. The Holy Spirit is God who works to magnify God's word and empowers his people to do his work on earth. And so as believers, we've got to keep coming back. We've got to be people of the truth, people of God's word, of truth, of truth. Okay, let's go to the second one. The, the Trinity is a unit. The Father plans, the Son accomplishes, and the Spirit empowers and applies the, the, finishing, the finishing touches. So let's continue on in, into the life of Christ. So remember, as Jesus began his ministry after God's public declaration and endorsement of his baptism, The baptism was meant to signify that that God had set Jesus apart to complete that that work. And and so God was also revealing to John at, 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 at Jesus' baptism that John's ministry was coming to a conclusion and that Jesus was now beginning his ministry, take up that ministry as a redeemer. That the baptism was also, in a sense, maybe a, you can look at it kind of a, as a change in leadership, almost like a, a passing of the baton, as it were. Um, Jesus' baptism was also a declaration to John, because God had declared, the one whom you see the Spirit of God descending, that's my deliverer, and that's the one that's come. But also in Jesus' baptism, Jesus was also giving a picture of his coming death, burial, and resurrection. As Jesus, as Jesus died and was buried, so he was laid into the water, immersed into the water. As he, was, as he came up out of the water, so he would be raised to newness of life. And God was revealing another picture of his coming death, burial, and resurrection. And we'll see more of that as we go along. So here's a question. Jesus is God the Son, right? 
So why would Jesus only begin his ministry once he was empowered, once he was indwelt by the Holy Spirit? Why the significance? What was Jesus wanting to reveal through this moment? He's wanting us to see that interplay, that interconnection between the Trinity, that, that, they're, that, they're, that interconnectedness, that, that dependency upon each other. And so as a result, God the Father and the Spirit's endorsement was huge as Jesus began his ministry. Um, Jesus is also declaring, he was upholding that unity and that cohesion in, 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 the, in the ministry. And, and so again, we remember that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus as a dove, not as a, as a physical dove. Now notice, let's go to Luke chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, as the Holy Spirit now indwelt Jesus, moving forward. And again, how does that all play? It's hard to explain, because Jesus is God the Son, and the Holy Spirit is God, is God the Holy Spirit. And so they're one, but how, to, how that plays together is difficult, except that this is what God's Word declares. So in, in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, notice what it says there. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they, they were ended, he was hungry. Okay, so at the end of Jesus' baptism, um, where, did, where, did Jesus, where, did, where did God the Holy Spirit lead him? Into the wilderness to be? To be tempted. Hang on a second, how does this work here? Full of the Holy Spirit, led by the Spirit into the wilderness. To be tempted. So again, we've got to see that, that work. And again, it's hard to explain. So we may be here. Was, was it the Holy Spirit that tempted him? No, no, it wasn't, was it? It was tempted, tempted of the devil. So why was Satan seeking to tempt Jesus? What was taking place here? Why would the Holy Spirit lead Jesus to this place at the, junk, at the start of his ministry? What, what, was, what was Satan wanting to accomplish? And what was Jesus declaring? Yes, because if, if, if Jesus fell into sin, would he be our deliverer? No, he would be a sinner, wouldn't he? And he, he wouldn't be able to rescue us. And so then what, what's the Holy Spirit leading Jesus to do and to overcome at this point in time? But think about that. Think of the first Adam. The first Adam, he was tempted by Satan. He fell, didn't he? And, and led all of us into sin. Christ has come as the last Adam. He's now being tempted. He's now being tempted by Satan. He's overcomes. And as a result, what can Christ do as the last Adam? He can lead us to freedom, can't he? He's overcoming. And so he's demonstrating, showing that he is, he is a sufficient Savior to lead us forward. See, the Holy Spirit was Jesus' closest companion while on earth, and while both were equal, now listen very carefully to this, while both were equal, the Holy Spirit empowered Jesus for his work. The Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit always operates as a single unit, never drawing attention away from each other, to each other. They are interconnected in every way. They are absolutely one in essence and nature. So think about that, and there's this interplay. So like when we say that, the Father plans, the Son accomplishes, and the Spirit empowers, applies the finishing touches, we've got to see that interplay, that interconnection, as they're working, and that they're meshing together, fitting together, different roles, different functions, but they all fit together to accomplish one objective and one purpose, and for God to be glorified, and we can't split them apart. See, this was true in our original creation. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all involved in it. It was true in, in the promise of the deliverer. God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were also all involved in its accomplishing. Now, think of us being new creations in Christ. Again, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all involved to accomplish that work in you and I. And that interplay, and we've got to see that how it fits together. This is also always true. Think about this, always true. Whenever God asked a man to do something in his word, God was always the, the, gave the plan. He was the one who accomplished it. He's the one who empowered it, and he's the one who put the finishing touches on it, didn't he? Like, think about, think about Noah and the ark. Think about it. Come back over here to the ark. It was God's plan for the ark, wasn't it? It was God's plan in how to build it together. He's the one that gave Noah the wisdom how to accomplish it. And then when it was all finished... Noah pulled the door shut, right? 
No, God put the finishing touches on it. And so we see that all the way through his word and his involvement in everything that he seeks to accomplish. This is huge. So here's a question. So why must God be involved in every aspect of his work? Yeah, so it glorifies him. Will God give his glory to another? No, he will never lead. He will never lead in such a way that somebody else or someone else or somebody or something else gets the glory. Everything comes back because it's all about him. See, the reality is truly Christ or God is the author and the finish of our faith. Oh, let's go back to Christ. So on the Sabbath, as, as, as often Christ... Uh, um, uh, purposes on the sabbath day the saturday christ would go into this into the synagogue the the meeting place of the jews and on this particular occasion in, in luke chapter 4 as christ went in he was given a scroll to read from so let's read what he says in, in luke chapter 4 and he's going to describe the the work of god the holy spirit in him and he's going to use truth to reveal that so verse 18 to, to verse 21 of chapter 4 of luke the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So here you are. So you're sitting in the synagogue. And so Christ stands up, and uh, again, they don't, they don't see him significant, they, just, they see him for just another man. He stands up, he opens up the scroll to Isaiah, and he begins reading this particular familiar passage to them, and then what's he say in verse 21? Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What are you thinking? How dare you? Yes, how dare you? He's personalizing, isn't it? This is shocking. And, and later on, he's, he's often, often uh, attested as, a, as speaking one who had authority. They were, they were in awe. So how important is the Holy Spirit's work in Jesus' ministry? Because notice what he says today. This past scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He's saying, this passage, verses 18 and 19, that's speaking about me. So as Christ is saying, this is speaking about me. It's speaking of the Spirit of the Lord is on me. So how important to Christ was the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. How important was it? The Spirit of the Lord is on me because, why? Yes, to preach the Word. And so Christ is realizing, if he's going to declare truth, what does he need? He needs the Holy Spirit to declare it with power. What else does God, what else is Christ acknowledging he needs the Holy Spirit for? Not just to preach the good news, but also send me to proclaim freedom, right? Freedom for the brokenhearted. So if he's going to set the prisoner free, the spiritual, spiritual ones free, how is it going to take place? Through the Holy Spirit. So now, this is incredible as we think about that. Jesus is God the Son. He, in every way, all of these characteristics apply to him. But Christ is declaring that if a work is going to happen within the life of an individual to be set free, it's, it's beyond his role. It's through the God, the Holy Spirit, because the Trinity is a unit. And Christ is acknowledging that. And so even in the recovery of the sight of the blind, Christ is all-powerful. He created the heavens and the earth. But if physical healing is going to take place, it's going to take place through? Through the Holy Spirit. And Christ is declaring this. This is, this is huge to see this, to see the filling and empowering the Holy Spirit. And so as a result, Christ refused to go forward without this anointing. It's crazy. It's, it's mind-boggling how to fit all of this together. But somehow, this is what God the Son reveals. And this, is, and this is the level of them being a unit and working together and that interplay and that connection and that depending and leading and submitting to and how that all plays out. And so we've got to see this interconnection to understand who he is. But the empowering work of God, the Holy Spirit, in the life of Christ went even deeper. It says in, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, that the Holy Spirit empowered Christ to go to all the way to the cross to shed his blood to set you and I free. God, the Holy Spirit, was involved at that level. 
Hard to understand. But he even goes further. Take, take, take your Bibles and, and turn over to Romans chapter uh, 1, verses 2 to 4. Which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Isn't that incredible? So to accomplish your rescue and my rescue from my sin and from your sin, it took God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to accomplish as in a unit, working together seamlessly and flawlessly to accomplish what, 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 uh, what had taken us and separated us from it. See, the Trinity always operates as a single unit, never drawing attention away from each other. They are interconnected. The Father plans, the Son accomplishes, the Holy Spirit empowers and applies the finishing touches. So let's apply this. <clears throat> We've been learning that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is, is one. Neither is one more or greater than the other. They are one in every sense. So this means that we dishonor God if we take one of the members of the Trinity and we pull him over here and we separate him and now this he becomes our everything and we talk about whichever member it is, whether it's the Holy Spirit is everything and we bring him over here, we separate him from the, the interconnectedness and we bring him over here and now we elevate and it's all about him and everything that he does. We've got ourselves into a problem because that's not, how God, that's not how God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit works. They work as a unit. And we've got to keep them connected. Otherwise, we get ourselves into trouble. <clears throat> as we continue in God's Word, God will reveal how the Spirit, how Christ immerses, um, baptizes believers in the Holy Spirit. All of this <clears throat> is through the direct work of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's not one over the other. They operate as a unit to bring us salvation. And they will operate as a continued unit to take us on to maturity and to lead us into all that he has for us as believers in Jesus Christ. So think about that. As the Trinity was involved in our original creation, the entire Trinity was involved in our recreation. And we've got to see God in all of his majesty and all of his glory like, it's, like in 101, we talk much about the work of God the Father and God the Son, but we've got to see now the interplay and the interconnectionness of, of God the Holy Spirit in the midst of all of that to accomplish um, God's purposes and His plans. And so this is, this is huge. God's completing that picture for us. Now, <clears throat> as we look at Luke chapter 4, this is huge for us as believers in Jesus Christ. This is what Christ declares... But Christ is leading us as believers in Jesus Christ. Remember, he's going to immerse, he's going to baptize us in God the Holy Spirit. So we've got to see something here. So let's read this now from where he's leading us. So the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me <clears throat> to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So as believers in Jesus Christ... <clears throat> How much do we need God the Holy Spirit to empower us? Do we dare go forward? Think about that. If Christ did not dare to go forward in ministry without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, what do we as believers in Jesus Christ need? Think about that. If we're going to proclaim the truth of God's word, notice that. If we're going to proclaim, uh, preach the good news to the poor, if we're going to proclaim freedom to the prisoner, how in the world are we going to be able to do it? The only way is through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The only way that we're going to be um, uh, to proclaim the acceptable favor of, of the uh, a favor of God for believers is through that as empowerment. See, all of this will become more and more clear as we go forward in God's word. And see, this is the huge this is the huge truth that God wants us to see. Not, as we look at God's word, not only was He our judge, but He was also our healer, wasn't He? God is also our commander, but He's also our enabler. 
And so God, what God calls us to do, he always enables us to be able to do it. He is involved in every aspect of his work. So as we come back to the truth that we are part of his disciple-making process, remember Mark chapter 1, verse 17, I will make you to become fishers of men. God doesn't send us out on our own to do something in and of our own strength. God says, I will empower, I will be your strength, I will be your enablement, I will make you to become. And it's through this anointing, this empowering. So as believers in Jesus Christ, as we go forward, it's imperative that we understand the work of God the Holy Spirit. Because that's the work, that's the empowerment to do what he's calling us to do. And God in his grace and his mercy, as we go on into his word, is going to reveal that. How do we move forward in that, in that enablement <clears throat> to understand his work and his empowerment? <clears throat> it's so incredible that God is the initiator and he is the, empower, the, the empowerment for it. Isn't he good? As we understand who he is and to understand the work of what, he's, what he does in our lives. He's, the, he's that initiator. <clears throat> Let me conclude. In these lessons, we're looking very specifically at God the Holy Spirit. And as I said, we've got to be very careful as we kind of take the Holy Spirit over here and we begin talking about him, that we begin to separate him from God the Father and God the, God the, and God the Son. And we can get ourselves into trouble that way. So we, we have to be careful as we're going. Each, each member has all of the characteristics of God and yet they have different roles and different functions. But each member's roles fit together, are connected. They mesh together with the roles of the other to accomplish God's ultimate purposes and his ultimate plans. And, and, and we've got to see that working out to play that through. <clears throat> but that being said, we as believers in Jesus Christ need to realize what God the Holy Spirit has, in, has, has provided for us. Think about that. God the Holy Spirit empowered holy men of God to receive his word, to write it down as he gave it, and to protect it so that we would provide it for us today. That's the gift of God the Holy Spirit to us today. And we've got to appreciate what he's, what he's accomplished. God the Holy Spirit empowered Christ as, our, as our, deli our, our deliverer. He protected his coming. He prepared his way. He empowered him to complete his work. And uh, he raised him from the dead. You see, everything that we have in our redemption, God the Holy Spirit's stamp is all over it. Um, we've got to see that God the Holy Spirit uh, revealed the truth of Christ to us. When we were broken in our sin, the only way that we, revealed, we understood the truth is God the Holy Spirit opened up our spiritual eyes to see what Christ has provided. He is the one that convicted you and me of our sin. He is the one that revealed the coming judgment that was to come because of our sin. He is the one that revealed the right way that we could be with God. And then guess what? As we humbled ourselves, he is the one that washed us. He is the one that's renewed us and brought us in as a child of God. He is the one that's made us new creations in Christ. You see, in our lives as believers in Jesus Christ, his stamp is on our lives. And he is the one that we, we need to be dependent upon in everything that we do whether it's putting in a circuit on a circuit board, whether it's preparing a meal, teaching a child, whatever it is, we need God the Holy Spirit to empower, to give wisdom, to give grace, to go forward. We came empty-handed into this relationship with Christ. And every day and every moment, we need His enablement to be able to go forward. He never calls us to rest on our own ability because he knew that we were never sufficient. He is enough for everything. Isn't he? I, I got to come back to it. Isn't he good? Isn't he good? This is God and his work in us. And think about that. If he's gone to this level in bringing God's word, in bringing Christ, and transforming us, will he not also? Will he not also <clears throat> enable to bring us into abundant life? 
is that not guaranteed as well? And all the richness of heaven and that, that relationship with him for all of eternity? See, this is what God has brought us into. And we as believers in Jesus Christ have to realize, have to appreciate that everything that we have is Christ. Or it's not just Christ, it's, it's, it's God, the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit as a connected unit and the richness of that relationship. You see, they could bless us with nothing greater than, they, than themselves. They brought us into that intimacy of relationship with them, with Him, a singular unit. And that's all that we have as believers in Jesus Christ. Isn't it incredible? And that's what God calls us to. And that's what he's um, giving us into. So rich. So free.